Can everyone do a thumbs up if they can hear me? Yay. Okay. I'm going to give it until 12.25 before we start because um, there were quite a few people that didn't manage to rename themselves within that previous session. And then at 12.25, we'll get going. For the couple new people that have just joined, we're just giving it until 12.25. Wonderful. And a couple more people, which is great to see. Right, we've hit 12.25, so I'm just gonna start and anyone that comes in late, um, Hopefully that will be okay. Okay, so good afternoon everyone and welcome to the breakout session on investing in social housing as a post COVID stimulus measure. My name is Abigail Lewis and I'm a research associate here at Per Capita. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from stolen land. Uh, the land on which I live and work belongs to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Uh, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge their elders past and present, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples we may have in the audience today. Um, we really can't have a discussion about social housing without first acknowledging that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have historically experienced much higher rates of homelessness and housing insecurity and have therefore been overrepresented uh, amongst people seeking social housing services. Um, or also without understanding that those experiences are a direct result of the lasting impacts of colonialism. Settler Australia has always and continues to dispossess Indigenous peoples from their homes. Um, so I just think it's really important that we all keep that in the back of our mind as we continue this discussion here today. So here is our agenda for the next 30 minutes or so, um, and also some housekeeping. Um, you'll note that you can probably now mute or unmute yourself, um, but please do keep yourself on mute unless we call on you during the interactive session. We're really keen to hear from you, but we're not keen to hear you uh, chewing away on your lunch. Um, also, if you renamed yourself completely uh, as the number four to enter this room, rather than just adding the number four to your name, please feel free to add your, um, your actual name back in so we can call on you by name um, if, if you'd like to speak later on. So first of all, I'm going to be delivering a quick presentation that goes over per capita's advocacy in the housing and homelessness space um, and argues for a national public house building program as a stimulus measure in response to COVID-19. And then next, my colleague Miffin Jordan is going to give a second presentation on why supply of public housing by itself is not enough um, and the kinds of design and community factors we must make sure we take into consideration to build social housing that is accessible to everyone. And then finally, and Miffin and I are gonna try and be as quick as we can to maximize this final session, 
um, we're going to have an interactive session where we plan to invite a few people from the audience to pitch for one minute each on their policy or campaign ideas to make this kind of national house building program happen in Australia. We've got a couple of people lined up already, but please um, just raise your hand in the chat um, if you're keen to pitch or if you're keen to speak for a minute or so and someone, um, uh, either myself or Caitlin, our tech support today, uh, will message you privately um, to let you know if we're going to be calling on you. So what is per capita calling for in this space? First of all, a significant investment in building, repairing and renewing public housing while ensuring we consider more than just supply. Decommodifying and definancializing the housing market by addressing some of the perverse tax incentives that we have in Australia that encourage investors to buy properties and then leave them vacant. A stronger regime of rights for tenants and protection against eviction. Housing all rough sleepers, which is something that COVID-19 has shown us is possible after all. And then we also have a specific program of research at Per Capita around supporting older Australians dealing with housing insecurity and homelessness. But today we'll be focusing on points one and two, uh, with me taking point one now and Mithun taking point two later in the session. So why do we need to build houses? Everyone here obviously already has an interest in public housing and will be aware of Australia's crisis of affordable housing. Uh, median rental prices in all our cities and many of our regional areas have skyrocketed and wages have not kept pace. To use Victoria as an example, as recently as 2004, close to 40% of rental properties in Victoria were affordable for lower income households. By 2009, that had nearly halved down to 20.9%. And by 2019, last year, it had hit just 14%. So that means that for the people on lowest incomes across Australia, the private rental market has become almost totally inaccessible. Um, and I'd really encourage you to look up Anglicare's annual rental affordability snapshots uh, to see just how inaccessible it is. Now that state of affairs has put incredible pressure on Australia's social housing system. As at June 2018, there were 104,600 people nationally on a waiting list for social housing. Um, the obvious result of this, so inaccessible private rental and inaccessible social housing, the obvious result of that is homelessness, um, which is on the rise in Australia. On census night 2016, there were 116,427 people registered homeless in Australia. It wasn't always this way. Australia used to invest in social housing. Between 1945 and 1970, so the post-war reconstruction years that you've been hearing about um, in the plenary sessions so far today, social housing comprised an average of 16% of all new builds in Australia. But from 1996 onwards, we've averaged just 3%. And it also isn't this way elsewhere. Um, this graph shows data from a few comparative OECD countries. Um, so you'll see that even if we discount the Netherlands, which has um, a very specific kind of historic socio-political reasons for having such a high proportion of social housing, at 4.6%, we aren't even close to the United Kingdom on this measure. Um, we're much closer to the United States, uh, which I'd argue is probably not where we really want to be on any chart. Um, so how many houses are needed? We have a really incredibly strong and thorough housing policy research space in Australia, and they're pretty united on this answer. Um, the Swinburne Institute for Social Research says that to meet current need, we would need to increase our proportion of social housing from 4.6% to somewhere between 6.6% and 8%. And if we just go back to this graph, you'll see that that wouldn't, you know, that, that is, isn't a huge increase and would keep us still at about half the rate of the UK. Um, but that's what we need to meet our current need. The Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute and the University of New South Wales's City Futures Research Centre both come remarkably close to agreeing on the number of new properties that we'll need to address the backlog um, and meet newly emerging needs. So somewhere in the region of 730,000 properties by 2036. That's 36,000 new dwellings per year. If we build 15,000 new dwellings per year, we'll maintain the status quo and just stop the existing problem getting any worse. Uh, but how many are we currently building? Around 3,000 per year. So clearly we need to build houses to meet housing need. 
But how does building houses meet our post-COVID economic needs? Why is house building a good stimulus measure? Put simply, because it creates jobs. The Centre for Housing Policy released a comprehensive literature review um, that showed that on average, every 100 new units of public housing built creates 80 jobs in construction, but also 30 ongoing support jobs um, related to supporting the tenants that ultimately live in those dwellings. So if we built that, those 15,000 units that we need in the next year just to maintain the status quo, we'd create 12,000 construction jobs and 4,500 ongoing support jobs. And that's not to mention the other jobs that would be created up and down the supply chain or jobs that would be created or maintained um, in local economies. And then finally, from me, the question that we should not forget to ask is what types of houses we should build. We need more social and more affordable housing in this country. And there are a range of measures that we would encourage governments to enact to mandate um, the construction of uh, the development of more affordable housing in Australia, such as mandatory inclusionary zoning. But in this moment, um, I think we're most desperately in need of more social housing. That is government subsidized rental housing provided at below the market rate to eligible, usually low income tenants. So social housing in Australia includes public housing, housing that is provided and managed by state and territory governments, and community housing, which is provided and managed by community-based organisations, usually in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, most social housing is still public housing in Australia, but over the last decade, we've actually lost 6% of our public housing. That's about 20,000 dwellings, while the community housing portfolio has doubled. So we're really in this current trend of um, transferring ownership and or management of public housing stock to community housing providers. Growth in the community housing sector is absolutely a good thing. Community housing is, is an important component of, a ro of any robust housing sector and all growth in social and affordable housing is to be welcomed. However, we feel that the growth of the community housing sector at the expense of the public housing sector is problematic. Investing in public housing should be the priority for the post-COVID rebuild. And that's because the evidence shows that public housing is by far the strongest preventative factor against homelessness. And public housing is still the only tenure that is truly accessible and secure for tenants facing the most severe housing insecurity or who, have the, or who face the highest risk of um, experiencing homelessness. And finally, within public housing, we also have to talk about more than just supply. We have to talk about design. We have to talk about accessibility. We have to talk about community. We have to talk about neighborhoods. So in the second half of this session, my colleague Miffin Jordan is going to be presenting on that in more detail. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and Miffin will start sharing her screen and unmute herself. Okay. Getting my hand on this on the technology there. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yep, we can. Yes, thumbs up, that's fantastic. Okay, well, welcome everybody to this session and thanks Abigail for, for the introduction. Um, I'm Miffin Jordan, I'm the Director of Social Innovation at Per Capita. Um, I've got a special interest in ageing, positive ageing and also in housing. I spent too many years working in public housing in the UK, so it's a, you know, it's a er key area of interest for me. So Abigail's introduced my topic really well. So we've talked about housing supply as stimulus, economic stimulus in the post COVID-19 pandemic. And this mirror is actually what was called for in the 1945 Curtin paper, which in similar circumstances we had, as you can see from those quotes, you know, we needed measures to make good the arrears and deficiencies in production that we had. And they recommended then a national housing program. And interestingly as well, a, a plan for land settlement as part of that. So the highest rate of new dwelling construction that available resources would permit was called for, and that was to involve federal government, the states, the union, the construction industry, and ordinary people. But as we know, a supply is not only about construction, because as Abigail alluded to, we 
you know, we need to think about that a bit more deeply and we need the right types of supply. Um, as many of you will probably already be aware, we have a lot of housing development in Australia um, and there's actually oversupply in some of those markets. So particularly the mid to high price range market, you, you know, luxury flats and CBD locations and also holiday destinations. So this all fits in earlier with what, what we heard the panel discussion talk about in relation to our investment or speculative model of housing and the commodification of property as, as a kind of a wealth generator. So within this context of a, of a lack of a supply of housing, we can actually see that, that on the last census night in 2016, there were over 1 million properties recorded vacant on that night. Obviously, some people may not have been there, but most of them were actually unoccupied properties. Now, this is at the same time, just to put it in context, that we had 116,000 Australians recorded as experiencing homeless that very same night. 16% of those were over the age of 15. So we have a huge amount of vacant properties and people that are experiencing homelessness, rough sleeping, couch surfing, living in cars, etc. Um, so we're talking about the right type of the supply, but it's not as simple as those vacant properties being able to house people experiencing homelessness. We need really specific uh, types of design. For example, Australia's population is aging. It's increasingly diverse. We know that one in five Australians live with a disability. That's 4.4 million and 15% of our total population is under 65. So we need um, housing design and communities that's going to be right for those people. So for new housing, it's really important that we have universal design standards made mandatory. And there's a lot of advocacy already around that, um, coming from aged advocates, disability advocates. So I won't go into too much detail about it there, but you can see some of the criteria which makes universal design available, not only for people needing new housing, um, but also the adaptations and modifications which help and support people to remain in the houses they live in. So that's particularly important for older Australians, older homeowners, but also some kind of mandatory um, legislation to increase that for people in the private rental market. Age-friendly design is another term for it. And it's really important in the context of thinking about social and public housing supply, that some of the issues around supply of, of, of subsidised housing is that it's not always of appropriate design. And that's even when you've got um, blocks that are kind of what, what we call 55 plus blocks, which are often mid to high density with elevators, and then not even those are appropriate. You can see here, I've put on the slide some um, estimates from the Australian Institute of Health and Wellbeing in 2017, who then saw that a one sixth of social housing units were unoccupied due to poor condition and inaccessible design. So again, you know, we do need more social and public housing, but it's really important that we look at the resources that we have and don't just focus on growth, 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 even though that may create jobs, but in fact, look to retrofitting some of the housing we've got, making it more energy efficient, making it sustainable, the importance of thermal, what they call thermal equity, but it becomes increasingly important in the context of high energy costs and climate change, particularly for people with chronic health conditions, older people, repairs and maintenance to existing property. And we've in fact already seen that economic stimulus um, for public and social housing just released by the state Labor government in Victoria and how much of that has been allocated to not for new housing supply, but in, although there is small amounts of that, but to repairs and maintenance and upgrade on current housing stock. So per capita has had a particular interest, which Abigail alluded to, so it's housing as well as ageing, and we've had a fantastic partnership this year working with the Australian Centre for Housing Innovation, TAXI, who hopefully most of you have heard of, and I, I can see Kerry's here to join us now, so she... Um, She's waving at us now. So we've been working for some time looking at what we've called a home for good for 
um, older Australians, all well, all Australians to you know age well in housing. So we published a series of policy briefs, one looking at home ownership one on improving private rental market um, sorry i can see my internet is a little bit unstable so i'll slow that down a bit and also on social housing for an aging population so some of this work has been driven by per capita and taxis findings working directly in co-design with older people about what they want in housing outcomes and the importance to kind of summarize that has been looking at a more social model of housing so it goes beyond built form and physical design to look at social environments particularly models such as co-housing or models of housing which include elements of co-care so communities of informal social networks where people can feel safe supported there's also financial benefits of course so shared costs shared risk um, and there's also shared governance, which can be really important in bringing communities together. Um, so, in fact, uh, I've got a, a copy there, you'll see, of a social co-housing property called Murundaka, which exists. So there already is co-housing and common equity in the social housing sector, but we'd really like to see much greater investment and in those kind of models and in um, specific cohort specific groups, so seniors co-housing, older women's co-housing. Um, I've, I've put a slide in here for some fantastic models coming from Wales. This is not just because I have a Welsh name, I actually don't have any Welsh blood in me, but I believe that part, you know, Wales and some other countries are really exploring the depth of how we can kind of broaden out types of social and public housing and bring in hybridity. So these are kind of cooperative models where tenants are on the board, not only tenants, but, but workers, housing staff, members of the broader community, family members of tenants. So they, they all, they bring together communities more broadly in social housing. Um, so you can go back, the slides will be shared if people want to look into that more. So it's beyond construction alone in terms of supply, important as those jobs are. And here we see some quotes from the Special Rapporteur on Housing, um, which talk about the exercise of autonomy, agency and self-determination for residents in housing and the importance of this in creating vibrant and sustainable communities, meaningful participation in design, implementation, and monitoring of housing polities. So we see housing fundamentally as a local issue that needs locally focused solutions, local choice, audits of housing need and co-development through participatory planning of um, how local housing strategies. We've talked about a duty for local councils to assist all people at risk of homelessness, not just priority groups. Uh, we also advocate for a licensing scheme for private landlords, the funding of which could be gathered locally and then redirected into a brokerage role for local councils working with community housing providers. But that local focus needs a national framework. Um, so we want to, as Abigail said, we want to challenge that speculative paradigm of housing. We want a national housing strategy that frames housing as a human right and public housing as essential infrastructure. We want to increase the ways that the community can access government land and land ownership. So that could involve having rights of first refusal for community groups with working with community housing um, providers and councils. So we need legislative, legislative frameworks for, and funding around community land trusts and community led housing initiatives. And I can't give you all the details on them there, but they're quite complex. But we also want, to, to, broadly speaking, a focus on community wealth over individual property ownership. And just to summarize it all up, I see there we've got a, a commonwealth. So part of this, it would involve access to land, for community housing or social housing supply, it could 
involves small scale developments rather than large ones in every region. It would drive local jobs, it could help with community buy-in and addressing some of the stigma attached with social housing and better network neighbourhoods. There are also particular opportunities at the moment with what we call the counter cyclical housing market. So ex-rental and investment properties could come onto the market for social housing providers to purchase and then use as central tenancies. Um, so generally speaking, what we're really aiming for, I think, and what this pandemic has really shown is that we need to be thinking about communities for well-being more broadly. So that brings in social connection, public health, we're not individual units all living separately, we are communities, we are a society. So from the outset, if we want the right outcomes, we need the right measures from the very start. And I'd love to hear any ideas or questions you might have in relation to that. But first of all, I think we're gonna to go to a couple of pictures and ideas from some people that we asked to speak to in advance. So I'll, I'll hand back to um, our tech support there or Abigail to put those through. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Mithin. Um, we are going to um, hand over to you guys now. Please uh, put something in the chat if you're keen to speak for a minute or so, and we're just gonna keep going until we get kicked back into the main session. Um, so the first person we'd love to go to um, is Andrea, who's the campaign coordinator at Everybody's Home, to speak for a minute or so about um, the Everybody's Home campaign. Andrea, feel free to unmute yourself and over to you. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot to uh, both of you for inviting me to just have a brief moment um, to spruik the Everybody's Home campaign. Uh, the campaign's been around for about three years. Uh, there are three essentially key asks around a building more social housing, and then, you know our target is five hundred thousand over ten years. So we are so, somewhat differing from yours, but I think it's similar. Um, we're also uh, talking a lot about renters and renters' rights in terms of their ability uh, to deal with the rise in rents and as we are seeing right now there's a lot of issues around that and landlords um, and the third thing that we are keen on is actually uh, improving uh, our welfare incomes and particularly things like new start which is now job seeker but because that actually keeps people out of being able to rent houses as well because they're not earning enough they're not, uh, they don't have enough income. So that, those are the key things. Um, currently, we are very focused on um, social housing because, you know, this is the moment when governments are talking about economic stimulus and they're talking about infrastructure. And we can't see why we can't include social housing in this moment right now because, as you all pointed out very well in your presentation, I think, there is such a lack of it. And we are, our services are constantly seeing people who, you know, are unable to find a roof over their heads. And the other thing that we're focusing on right now is the question of what happens to about three or 4,000 people who are currently in hotels that we put in there um, because that is also going to run out very soon as well as the moratorium, moratorium on, on renters. But I would encourage everybody to go and have a look at everybody's everybodyshome.org.au uh, and join us and also participate in our current action uh, around uh, sending a message to the federal parliament about funding more social housing. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and please feel free as well to pop a link in the chat to your to the website and to the action so that people can follow that link. Um, the next person we're going to ask to speak um, is Jeanette from Women's Property Initiatives. Over to you, Jeanette. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks, Abigail. Um, look, the main thing that I'm going to say uh, is really in relation to a national campaign that's been put out there by CHIA, Community Housing Industry Association of Australia. Um, it's supported by Homelessness Australia, Shelter as well, and, and Everybody's Home. Um, and it's called SHARP. Um, it's the um, Social Housing Acceleration and Renovation Program. So it was looking at um, 
three waves, uh, social housing maintenance and upgrading, acquisition of sites and properties requiring renovation, completion, which is suitable for social housing, then shovel ready projects and four longer term new development projects. So as um, I think Miffin suggested before, it sounds like the Victorian government has picked up a little bit on that. Um, we've certainly got the uh, maintenance and the renovation um, and refurbishment funding that's come out. We're really hoping that the shovel ready projects come out as well. I'd have to say, Abigail, I disagree with you a little bit around coming from a community housing organisation around that. Um, I, I really believe that the community housing organisations, and it was actually said by the um, Director of Housing in Victoria, that we actually can um, deliver more efficiently for social housing uh, rather than through government necessarily. So I think the other thing um, that community housing organisations are capable of doing uh, are really the more innovative projects. So going looking at what um, Miffin has outlined, there's certain community housing organisations that are particularly focused on disability accessibility, for example. We're focused on women and we identified many years ago the issue around older women and housing and have been working on some innovative projects to, um, to uh, launch, you know, to, to address that situation. One of them, which is co-housing and absolutely um, believe that co-housing is a, is a great option for older women, that supportive option. Um, and while on an ongoing basis, they can um, uh, share the, the costs, it actually costs a bit more upfront to build the co-housing, which is, something that uh, I think we all need to address. But uh, as um, uh, Andrea said, you know, the, the amounts that we're talking about, um, uh, um, have I, am I still here? <laughs> can you see me? Yes, we can see okay, you, sorry. No, I am gonna just, just I'll just look to everyone, I don't know why. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I'm just gonna have to cut you off so we can go to one more person before we get kicked no back problem. into I was just gonna say the, the amount through the sharp of the request for the dollars and the number of properties is absolutely very similar to what you had. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That's okay. Um, okay. And the next person would be Fiona York from the Housing for the Age and Advocacy Group. Hello. Um, oh, I've got 60 seconds. Wow. Um, I guess yeah. <laughs> what I would do to add to that is to say that we will be calling on government to have an affordable housing strategy that sets targets that they report against um, and that they are held to that. Um, we'd also like to see the land that's been designated as surplus to requirements being utilised for public housing builds. And we also need to see more system navigation for older people because older people are the highest number um, cohort growing of homelessness and there's we estimate 190,000 women at risk of homelessness that aren't being picked up in those numbers right now across Australia. And they need assistance to be able to navigate the very complicated housing and aged care systems. So that's my pitch in 16 seconds to go. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and sorry to the people that we couldn't get to. Um, please feel free to share any links in the chat uh, to your campaigns. Um, and 